Tonight, so that you may know and learn, I will tell you stories about our people, Bribri. I will explain how our god Sibu created the world, created the earth, created the sea, and all human beings. You shall learn about every rule and principle he left to our people, so that we may survive in this world. Here I am, a couple of cable lengths away from the coast of Costa Rica. The warm and nourishing waters of the Caribbean Sea carry me slowly towards the discovery of a new people, the Bribri, a community hidden somewhere among the mountains. Before I can reach them, I must make the acquaintance of the coast's inhabitants. <laughs> I'm from Panama, but it's been 38 years since I moved to Costa Rica. I came here to fish spiny lobsters, a fisherman's life. I started going out to sea when I was nine. I'm 66 today, and in a month I'll be 67. And I'm still going out to sea. I wanted my children to study. I even advised them against going to sea, at least not to work there, because today if we don't study, we have nothing. If I'd studied, I wouldn't be on the sea today because it's dangerous. This one has eggs. We leave it in the creel until it's laid them. Even though it's a good job, I didn't want them to follow in my footsteps. I wanted them to study so they'd become, I don't know, teachers or doctors, something like that. But, well... They like fishing, so I had to accept it. Being a fisherman is a worthy and honorable work. We steal from no one. People think right away that being a fisherman isn't much, but I don't mind because I know I'm working honorably. So that's it. It's a job my children enjoyed, and so they're welcome. All in all, it's a good job. <laughs> Since I've been living here on the coast, I've never dealt with the Indians. When I was in Panama, there was some sort of, of tradition with black people on one side and Indians on the other. We didn't really have much contact, you could say. Well, actually, we did. When we fished, they would take the fish and give us vegetables in exchange. Yes, I remember. We used to come with a boat full of fish and leave with a boat full of vegetables. That was our deal with them. (laughs) 
On that side of the border, the locals are called Bribris or Cabecaris. They used to live along the coast. But when the Spanish came in the 16th century, their whole way of living was turned upside down. The natives then withdrew inland, moving ever deeper into the mountains. Nowadays, there's a mix of people living on the coasts. With their origin on the islands just in front of the country, such as Haiti or Jamaica, these inhabitants of the Caribbean brought with them a culture, a way of life, practices and techniques that were unknown to the locals. Well, here we try to take care of the reefs because, in truth, everyone gains from it. We also do it so that my grandchildren may grow up knowing what a reef is, what a coral is, what a red snapper or a spiny lobster is. Taking care of it is of the utmost importance. While closing in on the foothills of the Talamanca Cordillera, the highest mountain range in Central America, I go through the inevitable intensive banana farms that standardize the landscape and pollute the environment with their chemical spreading. The other major cultivation in the region is cocoa, and there are still a couple of small, traditional and family-owned farms here and there, which grow the legendary pod. Cocoa consumption nowadays is so globalized that we forget that this plant, blessed by the indigenous gods, only grew in Central America. Indeed, it's from the gentle slopes of these hills, offering both the perfect amount of sun and rain, that the precious beans invaded the world to become chocolate. Before all this area was pure cocoa, and then everything disappeared because of the cocoa tree disease. It was because of the Americans who spread chemicals to kill off the patches and thus buy the lands at a cheap price to cultivate bananas. That's terrible, isn't it? I come every two weeks and cut off the pods that are ripe. We cut them, open them, put them in crates, clean them well, and then fermentation begins. During the first two days, we let everything rest and we don't touch the cocoa at all. We control the fermentation temperature and take good care that there's no air pockets. Then we start mixing during four, five or six days, depending on the customer's taste. Once fermentation is complete, we move on to drying. We start by spreading in thick layers because it continues to ferment for a while. And every hour we must mix everything. If you want to obtain a good product and there's sun, like today, you can count 15 days drying. When I take some cocoa in the palm of my hand and I smell it, it must not smell humid, wet, it must smell like a flower. When it's like this, it means the cocoa is perfect.
I truly think I will continue working in the cocoa business now. I have a daughter and a granddaughter, and I hope that when I'm gone, my granddaughter will take over and continue the tradition. Right now, I don't want to sell. Even if I'm offered millions, I won't sell. My father and my mother left all this to me. I must continue the family tradition. Nowadays, a couple of white people start working in this business, sometimes Indians, but cocoa has always been black people's business. You'll see almost no Indians around here. There are none in this region. They're all over there, near Bribri or Siksayola. There are a couple of dark-skinned people around here, but not many. In any case, no, there are no Indians in the area. You know, in order to build the road to here, we had to remove some trees, and when I saw this, I almost started to cry. When I see someone striking a tree with a machete, it's like I get hit. Because I love these trees so much, cocoa is fantastic. <laughs> 